Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Christopher McKee, who is Emeritus Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley. His research focuses on how stars form out of the diffuse interstellar medium of galaxies. Welcome, Chris. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with one of your older papers to set, sort of set the context for our discussion. Um, and it's entitled, A Theory of the Interstellar Medium, Three Components Regulated by Supernova Explosions in an Inhomogeneous Substrate. So supernova is essentially explosions, right, um, of stars. And, and so what are the three components you talk about here? Okay, well, uh, the three components were actually referred then to the gas in the interstellar medium of uh, our galaxy in particular, which is what we uh, focused on. So uh, everyone I think is familiar with the Milky Way and you can uh, see the stars, uh, at least on a, on a clear night. But yeah. in addition, there's a huge amount of gas that's in the galaxy about uh, with a mass that is uh, a little less than 10% of the mass mm -hmm. of the stars. And this gas comes in a, a wide variety of different densities and temperatures. And in this uh, paper with uh, Jerry Ostreicher, uh, what we did was to try to uh, systematize uh, all the available data and put together a coherent picture in which we uh, divided the physical conditions of this gas into uh, several uh, different uh, uh, types. One was what we called the cold neutral medium which is a gas that was uh, at a temperature of around 100 uh, Kelvin, uh, which is, in, you know, Fahrenheit is uh, like minus 370 Fahrenheit. Uh, yeah. So it's very, very cold by our standards, but uh, actually uh, not too cold by interstellar standards. Then uh, there's a warm neutral medium, which is a gas at lower density than the uh, cold neutral medium. And because of that, uh, it's, uh, cools less efficiently, and so it's hotter. And instead of being around 100 Kelvin, it's more like 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And then the new uh, component that we introduced, uh, or actually uh, based on earlier work by Donald Cox, was uh, a hot component of the interstellar medium, which uh, was due to the uh, supernova. So when the uh, stars, uh, or especially massive stars, sought to be above about eight solar masses, end their lives after say a few to 50 million years, uh, they can no longer support themselves and they have a titanic explosion and uh, release a huge amount of energy into the surrounding medium. Uh, they're also, when they're uh, put on a quite a light show as well, and there have been a few historical uh, supernovae. I believe that one of them, for example, was said to have been as bright as the full moon. Uh, Imagine looking up at the sky and seeing a star that bright. Uh, but uh, now astronomers study these supernovae in, in other galaxies. 
and they yes. temporarily become as white as solar galaxies. So anyway, they put out a huge amount of energy and that uh, produces shock waves, which race through the interstellar medium and uh, heat up this uh, cold neutral medium and the warm neutral medium and turn it into gas that has a temperature of order a million degrees. And uh, this gas then is at very low density, so it's uh, hard uh, to, uh, to see. But at, even at that time, there had been initial X-ray and ultraviolet uh, observations, which uh, indicated the existence of this being. So, so Chris, for my own understanding, so um, the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy, uh, has you said about ten percent of its weight, or ten not weight really, ten percent of its mass uh, is in in gas gas clouds, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are sort of, you, you describe three different components, a very cold one at 100 degree Kelvin, um, moderately hot one at maybe 10,000 Kelvin, and then really hot. Is that, is that right? Yes. And, and so, so it's it sort of, am I understanding it correctly that when a supernova explosion happens, you essentially have sort of a shock going through this fluid uh, that is at various densities and temperatures, right? Right. And so, so, so what, are the, what are the implications of that um, in, in that context? Well, as I mentioned, the main thing that happens when this uh, shockwave goes through the medium is that uh, it heats it up. The shockwaves that uh, we're familiar with on Earth are uh, sonic booms, but these are actually extremely weak uh, uh, shockwaves. Um, the uh, shock wave that occur as a result of a supernova explosion are many, many orders of magnitude stronger. So they can take gas and st at the start, you can start off maybe at 100 Kelvin and get uh, heated up to uh, actually even billions of degrees uh, when the supernova, uh, re the remnant of the supernova is young. And yeah. then as it expands, the typical temperature that it heats the gas up to is more like uh, a million degrees. And, and so, um, is a shock wave really taking taking this gas uh, gas clouds away from uh, away from the supernova, or what 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 happens afterwards? Yeah, and so uh, the uh, this the first comment I'm about to make only uh, I sort of work on later was that before the star explodes as a supernova, it already pushes gas away. These massive stars have very powerful uh, stellar winds. And they also have uh, produce a lot of ionizing radiation. And both effects tend to push the gas away. So that when the supernova explodes, it's probably going to explode in a low density medium. But then the shock wave runs in to these clouds that have been pushed away. And just as you uh, suggest, they uh, pushes on the clouds and accelerates them uh, away from the supernova. And in fact, uh, many years before our work, Lyman Spitzer, who was really the uh, or the father of the theory of the interstellar medium had suggested that uh, supernova explosions could uh, account for the random velocity that you see in interstellar clouds. And we confirmed that in our uh, analysis. Okay, so so how often does a supernova happen within, within our own galaxy? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, they're predicted to happen about once every 50 years, but uh, hmm. The last one that we uh, know about was, uh, I think it was uh, Kepler's supernova. There were two actually uh, around, uh, you know, 400 years ago, there were two that occurred in uh, quick succession. And I'm sure contemporary astronomers just wish that they uh, could have been living in those days, but with modern instruments uh, mm -hmm. to uh, study them. Then uh, a younger remnant, uh, which is well studied is called Cassiopeia A. That occurred only a few, uh, about 250 years ago, as I recall. Uh, that, it's not clear that it was ever observed. It is behind a lot of uh, uh, interstellar dust uh, that obscures yeah. the supernova, but it's been very well studied uh, since then. But um, so, and then I believe there's one other uh, young remnant that has been uh, detected since. But that, the number of uh, young supernovae remnants that we see is much less than the one for 50 years that's uh, predicted. So um, mm. hopefully uh, we will uh, 
be able to see some of these young remnants, um, you know, as we uh, have, get more powerful instrumentation. Because they would mainly occur in the disk of the galaxy. And as I just yeah. uh, mentioned, uh, we've been, I've been talking about the interstellar gas. In fact, all this gas contains uh, little dust particles and the dust uh, absorbs the light and means that you uh, really can't uh, see uh, that much of the light. So when you look at the Milky Way, that's, as you know, it's a very faint band of uh, stars, but that's because we're only seeing the stars uh, that go out to uh, maybe uh, a few thousand light years away. But the Milky Way is much, much bigger than that. And if there were no dust, then the uh, stars, the, we'd, be, we'd be able to see a lot more stars and the Milky Way would be uh, a lot brighter. So the supernovae that have occurred uh, uh, recently uh, quite possibly have been obscured by all this dust. And so we just haven't been able to see them yet. Mm. And so so based on the, the number of stars in the galaxy, our expectation of the frequency uh, of what we well, uh, of a supernova happening in the in the galaxies about fifty years one per fifty years yeah um, but uh, we don't see that um, so uh, are there any um, is it just sort of a random <laughs> random occurrence uh, you know sort of a quiet quiet period um, or is there something more to it well it's quite po uh, possible that we're just in a uh... A, a random, there are, you know, in a random period where there are not as uh, many as usual. As I mentioned, uh, at around um, uh, 1600, they were very common. There were two within 30 years, I believe. And the two that are fairly, they were close enough so that they could actually be observed uh, with the mm -hmm. naked eye. Um, so uh, it's the combination of uh, the fact that we uh, appear to be in a low period. And then, as I said, most of them are... Uh, should be occurring uh, in the disk of the galaxy where they're very hard to observe when they, uh, because of all this obscuration. So if, if a powerful supernova happens, um, what does the, you know, I mean, it, it could create some issues for us, right? So, so what is sort of the safe distance uh, for a supernova for, from an Earth's perspective? That is a very good uh, question. I don't really, uh, and, and people have looked at that. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, aware of the of their results, so I can't give you a detailed answer. But there are several different effects that occur. You first, yeah. you would get the uh, enormous flash of light, and um, it's possible that that would uh, uh, have a, a destructive effect on the ozone layer. So, uh, which would then allow uh, ultraviolet radiation from the sun to reach the ground, and that would be very bad for all uh, life on the, on the ground. So um, we, in fact, there has been an explosion, uh, not a supernova explosion, but an explosion on a uh, magnetized rotating neutron star with a very strong mm -hmm. magnetic field called a magnetar. And that explosion uh, actually did uh, ionize the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere. So they, uh, if you can imagine, this was, I believe, around 30,000 light years away. So it's not at all near uh, the sun. And despite that, this uh, enormous burst of energy was able to affect the atmosphere. So that's one thing that will happen. Another thing that occurs is that the supernovae uh, accelerate cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are particles that are moving at nearly the speed of light and they pervade uh, the galaxy. And uh, the, we're protected from them to some extent, first of all, by the solar wind, which tends to keep them out. Then the ones that are able to get in through the solar wind and get to the location of the Earth, they, uh, we have a magnetosphere, which uh, then also prevents them from uh, striking the Earth. But uh, the uh, supernova, if it were uh, uh, near enough, would be, uh, produce a much higher intensity of cosmic rays that would have uh, many more uh, molecular particles coming in. The ones that do mm -hmm. penetrate, the ones that have high enough energy to get through uh, the uh, both the solar wind and the Earth's magnetosphere, come all the way to the ground. And in fact, uh, even right here in in our country, there's one there are cosmic rays going through us all the time. 
And if you go to a place like Denver, which is, you know, uh, a mile above sea level, there is less atmosphere shielding you from the cosmic rays. So actually you get a more intense uh, radiation from these cosmic rays uh, in Denver, say, than you do here in Berkeley. Um, but if you were very, if you were near a supernova, say within uh, from 100 or 200 light years, then it's uh, likely that you would be exposed to some of a period, maybe of thousands of years, where the intensity of the relativistic particles would be much, much higher, and that could have a, uh, you know, you're getting a lot of radiation is certainly not a very helpful. Yeah. So, so the neutron star uh, explosion you mentioned, 30,000 light years away, we have some observable um, impact on the Earth's atmosphere. So is it, is it fair to say anything within, let's say, 100,000 light years uh, could potentially have an impact? Um, yeah, I think of supernova, um, if it, uh, I have to be, actually, I don't, re I don't remember what the uh, instantaneous uh, flux was. The, the, a supernova yields far more energy than this yeah. explosion on this uh, magnetar. Uh, but what happened with the magnetar was it was an extremely brief flash so that the energy that it did release was released in a very short period of time. And so I actually don't know uh, how the intensity of that radiation would compare with the intensity of the radiation from a supernova, which would go on for uh, typically say a order of 100 days or so, instead mm -hmm. of just a brief uh, flash. And this info, this uh, waves um, are really traveling at the speed of light. So is it, um, uh, so if something happened, let's say today, at 100,000 light years away, we wouldn't know that happened for 100,000 years. That's right? correct. And so is there is there anything that, uh, I guess the <laughs> information could travel faster than light. And so we wouldn't know if anything is, anything has happened um, and uh, something is traveling toward us, uh, if it's within that, if it's not within that window uh, of, of information. That's correct. So it's true that when I talk about, so I said that there were two supernovae that occurred a few hundred uh, years ago and that uh, Tycho and uh, Kepler were able to observe them. Um, but in fact, they are several they're thousands of light years away. So that in fact, uh, if you wanted to look at uh, current time, uh, they actually occurred uh, thousands of years ago. But yeah. the light just reached us. So we say, well, you know, they, we, we just keep track of what's going on as we measure it. And of course, this goes on when you look at, at distant galaxies. Uh, they are, if they're millions of light years away, that means the light we see uh, actually originated millions of years ago. And it goes all the way back to the Big Bang. When we, if you look at the uh, uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, that radiation was emitted a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So that's over 14 billion years ago, but we're just seeing it today. Hmm. Uh, are, are there some uh, empirical, some sort of a heuristic um, that, that basically says what the energy output would be uh, when a supernova happens based on the characteristics of the, of the star? Yes. Uh, now, actually, the, uh, the, the total energy that's uh, emitted in a supernova uh, uh, the typical one at least seems to be uh, sort of independent of the mass uh, of the uh, uh, pre-supernova star. And <coughs> the, and that's because there's sort of a, a convergent uh, stellar evolution. The star is uh, just like the sun is hottest in the middle and that's where the nuclear reactions are going on. Well, yeah. as uh, a massive star evolves, uh, the nuclear reactions also occur most rapidly at its center. And so first it burns hydrogen to helium, then helium into carbon, and then it starts building heavier and heavier elements until actually you build up a, a core of iron. And uh, you can't really release any energy by a fusion for elements uh, 
that are heavier than iron, uh, then that's fission. As you know, if you have atomic power, that you have uranium, so that's much heavier than iron, and you release energy by having the nucleus break apart. Uh, but whereas with uh, light elements, then you can release energy by bringing the elements together. And so iron is right in this sweet spot, which is in between. So once you get to that, and the maximum mass that that uh, uh, core can have and still be able to withstand gravity is a little bit more than one time the mass of the, uh, than one solar mass. And so that's sort of, no matter how big the star was to start with, it winds up with this center, which has uh, at about the, uh, the same mass. And then when it's burned up and it can no longer uh, release enough any uh, energy by nuclear reactions, uh, the, uh, the the heat leaks out um, and then it's no longer supported. So it starts to undergo a collapse and that uh, releases a lot of energy uh, that actually then causes an outward going shock. So you have simultaneously something that's collapsing down to much higher density uh, to the density of a neutron star and uh, an outward going shock that then blows the outer layers of the star uh, away and uh, creates this uh, extremely luminous uh, uh, outburst. So, so, so regardless of the, so regardless of the initial conditions that you start with, the, the, the size of the star, ultimately you end up with uh, approximately one solar mass core, right, of, of heavy elements. <laughs> And so, so when supernova happens, that core is sort of standard. Is that, is, did I understand that yeah. correctly? Now I'm uh, describing the uh, type of supernova that occurs for massive stars more than about eight times the mass of the sun. And those are uh, called uh, astronomically, they're type two supernovae. Um, but there's a whole different type called type one supernovae, uh, which uh, actually occur in low mass stars. And so they're, um, how they occur is actually a topic of very uh, active research now. And it's thought that in uh, many cases, they have, they occur as a result of a uh, being in a binary system. And then depending on what happens in the binary, you can make the uh, one of the stars in the binary get more massive than can be uh, supported um, by uh, pressure. And then it collapses and makes a, a supernova. And this, it turns out that the characteristic mass of those stars is not that different than this mass I was talking about before. It's a little bit more than one solar mass. Um, you may mm -hmm. be familiar with the famous uh, astrophysicist, uh, Chandrasekhar. And he uh, very famously, uh, I believe it was back in the 1920s, actually uh, predicted that there was a maximum mass that uh, stars like the sun uh, could have and uh, when they were very, very old and exhausted all their uh, nuclear fuel. And that is, uh, so that's called the Chandrasekhar mass. And it is <clears throat> about well, one and a half times the mass of the sun. And uh, once, if you can take, if you're in a binary and you can transfer mass from one star to the other, and yet so that that star gets more than this mass, then it will undergo a, uh, a collapse and explode. So um, the, the standard candles that we talk about, that is super, uh, that's type two or type that's, one? Uh, those are type one. Those are type one. So, so uh, it doesn't matter uh, uh, wherever this happens, we could, we could have an, we could standardize uh, based on the, um, based on the, the intensity of light, where, how, how far it is. That's exactly right. So the, uh, I, I mentioned that there is a tendency for the type two supernovae that, that occur in the massive stars to be similar. But in fact, there are a lot of different uh, kinds of type two supernovae and astronomers have classified them. And it, that's, a, 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 again, a very active area of, of research. So they're not nearly as good uh, as standard candles. Their uh, luminosity can vary by uh, you know, factor of 10 or so from one supernova to another. Now, the type one uh, actually occurred, there are different kinds of type ones, and the standard candles are the so-called type 1a, which are the classic ones I was talking about with this uh, Chandrasekhar mass. And uh, then it is uh, 
be, because that Chandrasekhar mass is, is well determined, uh, you would think that then all the supernovae should be the same. But uh, Mother Nature is much more complicated. And so we found that actually even the type 1a supernovae can have uh, different uh, brightnesses. But it was discovered that it's possible to uh, sort of uh, standardize them that depending upon the time evolution of the brightness, you could then take that information into account and determine what the intrinsic luminosity was. And so that uh, trick was good enough so that it was possible to uh, know what the actual luminosity of the star was. And then uh, just as if you're thinking about uh, you're, you're outside and you have a friend with a flashlight, as the friend walks away, the flashlight will get dimmer and dimmer. And so you could actually figure out how far away your friend is by you know how bright the flashlight was. Uh, and that's because you would know how, uh, how bright it was intrinsically. Well, the same thing is true with the supernova. If you know how much energy is emitting uh, per unit of time, then the farther away it, it is, the uh, uh, dimmer it will be. And by measuring how bright it appears, you can figure out how far away it is. And it was uh, through observations of that type that uh, one of my colleagues here at uh, Berkeley, Saul Fulletter, and his uh, uh, collaborators uh, was able to uh, determine uh, that the universe it, it expansion is actually accelerating. Whereas uh, prior to that point, most people had been assuming that the universe was, de uh, was uh, decelerating and would eventually recollapse. Yeah, so so that that's one of the techniques used to um, to, to compute the cosmological constant, right? The uh, how fast the universe is expanding, and I guess there are some controversies around, not necessarily controversy, but the the numbers are not really matching uh, from uh, from different observations. That's right. No, it's a very interesting uh, problem. So um, I'm old enough to remember the a classic argument between two very famous astronomers, Alan Sandage at Caltech and Gerard de Vaucouleur at the University of Texas. And they were trying to measure the uh, Hubble constant, which was made famous by Edwin uh, Hubble. And that is uh, how fast uh, the galaxies are expanding away. Now, it, it's, uh, if you think about our space, it, it, it's kind of expanding. So one an analogy which uh, astronomers like to use is imagine that you are making raisin bread and you uh, put a bunch of raisins in some dough, and then you put in uh, you know, some yeast to make the dough rise. Well, you could start off with a small ball of dough, and then as the yeast got to work, the dough would expand, it would get larger. And then you would, you would think about, if you look at all the raisins, they would see, every, if you were stood on one raisin, you would look out and all the raisins that you looked at would be moving away from you, and the raisins that were farther away would move away faster. And so that's basically uh, the uh, uh, Hubble expansion. And uh, they uh, were able to uh, go ahead and, and measure this, but the controversy was uh, Sandage said that it was uh, uh, 50 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. That means if you're 3 million light years away, that's the megaparsec, then uh, something would be moving away at 50 kilometers per second. Whereas the vocaler said, no, 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 that's totally wrong. Uh, that's 100. <laughs> they were off by a factor of two. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, interesting enough, uh, with more precise measurements, it turned out that the correct answer was halfway in between. It's about 70. So, uh, but now there's a controversy because, uh, as you just alluded to, that if you make observations, uh, cosmological observations of the microwave background, you tend to get numbers that are a, a little bit lower than if you use these standard candles. But mm -hmm. instead of a, a difference of uh, you know, a factor of two, now it is uh, you know, uh, less than 10%. So we're getting mm -hmm. to be uh, much more accurate. And people are working very hard on this. And I think that uh, regardless of how uh, it turns out, we're going to learn a lot. So the conventional explanation would be that somehow one of the uh, assumptions that has gone into estimating the, the, the distances are wrong. But since people have worked on that very hard, that would uh, uh, be very surprising. We would learn a lot just from uh, discovering that error. The other and more exciting possibility 
is that actually uh, this simple picture we have uh, in which uh, we have a, a simple Einsteinian universe with a, co a cosmological constant is not exactly correct in that maybe the cosmological constant is a function of a position or of time. And uh, so and there's some new uh, aspect of physics that's coming in and causing this uh, change. So that when you measure the uh, Hubble constant from the microwave background, which is based on things that happened 14 billion years ago, and compare that with observations of supernovae, which maybe occurred only uh, 5 billion years ago, the fact that they're different answers means that there's some new physics. So we'll, I think we'll uh, understand that within the next decade. Yeah, that, that'd be very exciting. Uh, so on the supernovae measurement side, Chris, uh, since we have a lot of them, couldn't we uh, sort of derive, if uh, the cosmological constant is uh, time and location dependent, couldn't we actually see that uh, by looking at different supernovae? Well, that's one of the uh, things that people are uh, doing is they're trying to get much more precise uh, data to uh, uh, try to pin down whether there is uh, any effect like that. And um, the, so this, the simple model actually does just have this, the, the cosmological constant that Einstein uh, put in, which, you know, he called it his uh, greatest blunder, um, but then it was, now it's been resuscitated. And it explains all the data we have now but uh, yeah. one of the uh, major telescopes that's going to be coming online uh, in a two or three years is uh, called the, uh, 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 let me see, uh, the Rubin uh, Observatory. It's the large synoptic uh, survey telescope. And yeah. um, that is going to scan, look at the whole sky, at, at least the whole sky visible from uh, Chile and uh, every four days. And so it's gonna be an ideal instrument for measuring time dependent phenomena like uh, supernovae. And we will learn uh, a lot more about that. It's also going to look at a different effect, which is uh, with gravitational uh, lensing. You'll be able to get uh, very detailed uh, pictures of galaxies and see uh, how the, their shapes are affected uh, as they the light propagates uh, to us, and you can analyze that and uh, see whether there are any new effects that are coming in, uh, uh, you know, uh, due to that. Yeah, we'll take a quick break, uh, Chris. When we come back, we'll talk about um, the other papers uh, in the area of theory of star formation. Okay, great. I'll talk to you in a few minutes. Yeah. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back, uh, Chris. Uh, we, we were talking about uh, supernovae explosions uh, and uh, potentially the impact of supernovae explosions on us, how frequent they occur, um, and really different types of supernovae and the measurements of some of those uh, that could give us some clues as to even the expansion of the universe. Um, I want to go into another paper uh, in 2007 on the theory of star formation. Uh, you say a conception of star formation has emerged in which turbulence plays a dual role, both creating over densities to initiate gravitational contraction or collapse, uh, but also countering the effects of gravity in this over dense regions. Um, and so two opposing effects um, and so both of these um, have, have an impact on how ultimately the star is formed. Yeah. Uh, how, how does it work? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So um, one of the observations of the interstellar medium had shown that uh, it, it was uh, turbulent, but this uh, aspect of the interstellar medium wasn't really focused on uh, very much 
uh, until the very end of uh, the 1990s. And then people increasingly started uh, uh, looking at that. And one of the major reasons they were able to at least became uh, more uppermost in theorists' minds was it was possible to do numerical simulations. And you could actually then see what happened in the computer uh, when you have gas that showed the uh, velocity that you ob actually observe. And uh, it was re recognized that under those conditions, you uh, essentially recreate, you have a, a turbulent situation. So turbulence uh, in the atmosphere and the ocean is uh, responsible for uh, lots of uh, phenomena. And uh, it's one of the classic problems in classical physics that has never really been uh, solved. So there's, we know a lot about uh, turbulence, but there is no sort of first principles theory that can actually predict all the uh, phenomena that you see. So uh, that is actually then uh, an, uh, something that physicists are studying uh, today. Now, in the interstellar medium, uh, as we discussed earlier, we have these different uh, uh, components of gas. And there's another very important component that uh, Ostreich and I did not consider in our original paper, and that is the molecular gas. Uh, and gas is, is even colder than the cold neutral medium. It has a temperature of more of about 10 or 20 uh, degrees Kelvin. And uh, that means that uh, sound travels uh, very slowly in those uh, clouds. Um, so the, the speed of sound actually depends on the uh, temperature of the gas because that determines how fast the molecules are moving. So because you have a very slow speed of sound, but you observe that these velocities in the clouds are much faster than speed of sound, that means that instead of having the type of turbulence we have on Earth, which is the, where the velocities are very small compared to the sound speed, you have uh, turbulence where the velocity is very large compared to the sound speed. And uh, so this is something that uh, people have now devoted a lot of uh, work in studying uh, numerically, and we have a better understanding of it. And uh, as I uh, uh, as you mentioned in that uh, review article, you have these two competing effects. So one of the things is, uh, since it's uh, supersonic, what that means is that I have a velocity uh, of the flow, which is very large compared to the sound speed. And that means that the uh, pressure uh, that occurs when uh, two pieces of this gas collide is very high and it compresses the gas. So what is that? that uh, oh, go ahead. It is the same, if, same, um, that when, I know that when supersonic um, aircrafts travel, um, you get this uh, booms, right? Is that the same sort of thing? Right. Uh, so the, the sonic boom, of course, when you actually hear it, um, it's the, the plane is far away. And so that sonic boom is a very, very weak shock. We're talking yeah. about uh, very strong shocks. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, if you have, when you have the space shuttle, when it re-enters the atmosphere, uh, can create a shock that would, uh, might have a, um, velocity compared to the sound speed that's similar to the shocks we're talking about. Okay. And if you've seen a, you know, the pictures, I guess, of them uh, where you can see that uh, at least uh, maybe an artist's uh, visualization, you can see this very hot uh, gas which is surrounding the nose of the space shuttle as it comes in. And yeah. so that's what happens. You get the uh, gas gets compressed and it gets heated. Uh, now in the case of the uh, this molecular gas uh, in the interstellar medium, uh, it can cool very efficiently. So it doesn't get heated that much by the shocks. It mainly just gets uh, compressed. And the, uh, one of the things that astronomers uh, discovered, and this, uh, most of this work was done after the paper we talked about before that I uh, wrote with uh, the Jerry Ostreicher in 1977, they discovered that stars are forming in this molecular gas. In fact, uh, all the stars that we observe that are forming are forming in this uh, very cold, dense uh, molecular gas in the interstellar medium. And uh, so because it's supersonically turbulent, that means that you can compress it 
which is good. You need to get the gas to be very dense in order to make that star. On the other hand, if I look at it from a larger scale, uh, if I try to compress a turbulent medium, I will have all these shock waves running around inside it. And if, when I'm pushing on it, if a shock wave hits me where I'm pushing, it will try to uh, you know, push me away. So it also, uh, this turbulence can act to resist gravity uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, causing compressions. Yeah. So, um, so I remember, Chris, a uh, long time ago, uh, I did some work in, uh, in engineering and we used to use this computation fluid dynamics software, mm -hmm. you know, to sort of model um, airflow and things like that. So the numerical simulations that you talk about here uh, are similar to that CFD type models. Um, they are similar, except the ones I'm talking about, most of the CFD models uh, assume that the flow is very slow compared to the speed of sound, unless you're yeah. dealing with, you know, a supersonic aircraft. But typically you assume, uh, I'd imagine particularly as you're doing it. And so that has the advantage that uh, you can assume that the fluid is incompressible. And yeah. so that, that simplifies uh, matters. Now, a complication that uh, you have in engineering that we generally don't have is that you have uh, boundaries. So if you're trying to simulate an aircraft, then you have this yeah. very complicated shape of the wing and you have to deal with that. Whereas uh, we're out in the middle of space and so mm -hmm. there are no boundaries. Uh, and uh, then uh, so that, that simplifies the, the thing. Yeah, so you don't have a lot of interactions, but the behavior inside uh, is quite different because of the, the just, just the speed at which it's collapsing. Right. Right, I, I didn't catch your question, so could you repeat it? So, so you don't have interactions with other surfaces and so on, but, um, but inside, the, inside the star itself, uh, everything is moving uh, at a speed that is much, much higher than the speed of sound. Right. No, not inside the star, but inside this molecular cloud. So, inside. yeah. So the molecular cloud uh, is, uh, you know, can be uh, a few light years to hundreds of light years in size, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where you have all this uh, turbulence. And what you find is typically that as you look at larger regions, you find that the uh, uh, average turbulence velocity gets larger and larger, and. Uh, that's something that you actually see in uh, earthbound uh, turbulence as well. Um, but uh, so, so these these uh, effects that you talk about here, um, they are uh, sort of necessary conditions for star formation, or it's something that you're observing in certain scales. The well, the, the necessary condition for the stars to form is that you uh, be able to accumulate enough gas so that the uh, gravitational force exceeds all the fo uh, forces that are trying to support it. So the star can be supported by uh, gas pressure. If you look at the sun, for example, uh, it's in a nice equilibrium in which you have uh, the gas pressure is uh, pushing out and the gravity is pulling in and the sun is just uh, sits there and is, uh, you know, uh, very quiescent. In the molecular gas, when I'm talking about it, a molecular cloud that's uh, you know, many light years in size, and it has all this turbulence in it, then there are regions which will uh, get compressed and get to high enough density so that the, the gravity can overcome the thermal and turbulent pressure uh, inside that gas, and then that cloud will start to uh, collapse and will form a star. So, so the, the turbulence uh, acts uh, like a sort of a pressure pushing it, uh, pushing it away um, against the gravitational contraction? Yeah, so the turbulence tends to resist. Uh, if, if I think of a given volume of gas, the turbulence uh, tends to resist uh, compression uh, because it's basically, in the absence of gravity, if you have a turbulent uh, uh, region, it will tend to expand. Uh, and then, uh, so that's resisting the, uh, the attractive force of gravity. You have to get enough gas 
in and have the turbulence be weak enough so that the gravity can overcome the uh, this uh, turbulent pressure. And you also have thermal pressure if uh, for particularly in regions of uh, where stars uh, of solar mass or less form, then you eventually get to a high enough density so that the thermal pressure is, is actually bigger than the turbulent pressure. And uh, then again, it's a question of uh, trying to, uh, to look at the balance. There are uh, small cloudlets that are seen where you have appear to have a, a very good balance between thermal pressure and gravity, but instead of being the size of a star like the sun, they are a light year in size. Uh, <laughs> but these uh, will then tend to accrete more material, and at some point they will, as you add on more material, the gravity gets uh, stronger and stronger, and eventually it will collapse and form a star. Yeah, so it's it's set of <laughs> a complex set of processes that ultimately settles down into a star, mm -hmm. and um, I guess so. How long does it take for a molecular cloud to, to to form a star? Is that is that measurable? Yeah, so astronomers uh, have uh, spent a lot of time measuring this. They can look at um, stars at different stages of evolution and also of these uh, clouds at different stages of evolution and try to then, uh, if you can essentially determine the lifetime of one of the phases, you can then by looking at how the other phases, uh, you know, how many of them there are, you can get relative ages. And so yeah. typically uh, people think that for a star of the mass of the sun, it's going to form in a, a few hundred thousand years uh, mm -hmm. from uh, this, once you have sort of accumulated the amount of molecular gas that you have. Um, now there's a, a question as you go to uh, more massive stars, if they uh, were to form uh, exactly in the same way that uh, low mass stars did, then because they had more mass, they would take longer and they might say, well, maybe they'd take a million years to form or even millions of years to form. Um, hmm. But uh, on the other hand, it appears that these stars, on the contrary, tend to form from a denser gas that is internally turbulent. And as a result, they uh, form perhaps even in a shorter period of time than the less massive stars. So, you know, less than 100,000 years. Mm -hmm. And so, since these are dynamical processes, so the, the gravitation, the turbulent space pressure, the the thermal pressure. So, uh, so are there objects, Chris, out there that you know sort of um, never really settles into a star but goes back and forth in some way? I'm just, uh, uh, I don't know anything about it. Just asking the question. Sure. No, uh, it, that's undoubtedly the case that, in when we're talking about this uh, turbulent uh, motions, then. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, you have these shock waves coming there, essentially creating dense regions. And then there's this question as to, uh, you know, which is uh, larger, the uh, internal uh, pressure uh, due to uh, turbulence and uh, thermal pressure or the gravity. And in some cases, the internal uh, pressure uh, will be greater so that this uh, density concentration will just be a transient and will expand uh, back out. And there could also be cases, and this is a very interesting situation. If you uh, uh, look at uh, how stars might form at the centers of galaxies where you have these supermassive black holes, yeah. then there are also very strong shear effects because as the gas is sort of orbiting around the uh, black hole, then as you go out farther, the gas moves more slowly. So you can take a, a gas cloud and stick it near a, uh, a you know supermassive black hole and watch it go around. And if the gravity is not strong enough, it will go ahead and just get sheared apart into uh, a ring, and that would prevent it from. Uh, mm. from yeah. So, so the so the balance you need, so to speak, uh, to ultimately form a star, uh, is, is a function of how far the star is from the center. Yeah, so, if, well, if you are in the vicinity of the center, then it, that is a very strong effect. But when you're out where we are, then it, uh, it doesn't really matter that much. 
but um, I, would like to, I would like to make one other comment on that, though. That yeah. we were talking about the formation of a star. If I say, well, how does the molecular cloud uh, form? Remember, the stars yeah. are going to be small pieces of this big molecular cloud. Well, how did the cloud form? And out here, even where we are, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, between 20 and 30,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy, then the uh, uh, the forming of this molecular cloud, you have to overcome the this shear effect that I was talking about. So the gas, as you get farther and farther away from the center of the galaxy, it uh, actually um, is, is moving at about the same velocity, but because it uh, has farther to go around, uh, it means that, you know, two points at a different a distance from the galaxy will gradually separate from each other. And you have to have the gravity uh, in the molecular gas be large enough to prevent that from happening. So, so the, the intensity of star formation, isn't it close? Isn't it more uh, as we get closer to the um, center? Uh, yes. Uh, and that is uh, most likely uh, due to the fact that the, you have more molecular gas there. Now, mm -hmm. actually in our galaxy, uh, it's been recently realized that um, it is uh, what's called a, a barred uh, spiral, spiral galaxy. So mm -hmm. instead of just being uh, a nice smooth uh, disk with spiral arms, it, when you get in within about uh, 10,000 light years of the center, there is a, a, a bar, I don't know if you've seen pictures of uh, some barred spirals. It's, they're quite yeah. dramatic. And uh, then when you get sort of uh, within uh, that distance, or maybe a little bit closer, the rate of star formation actually goes down a lot. Yeah. Then when you get right near the center within hundreds of light years of the center of the galaxy, then the star formation rate uh, goes up again. But there yeah. does seem to be sort of a hole in the uh, star formation in the galaxy uh, that's uh, presumably caused by this bar. And this molecular cloud, um, Chris, that, that is basically hydrogen gas or something different? Yeah, it's ma uh, mainly composed of molecular hydrogen. And one of the uh, things that is very interesting is that molecular hydrogen is itself very difficult to uh, observe. Uh, mm. And uh, the, uh, unless you can get it very uh, hot. So in the cold interstellar medium, it's essentially invisible. And the result, what uh, astronomers have done is to uh, look for other molecules. And the most abundant other molecule is carbon monoxide. So, you know, if that's on Earth, uh, we know that's poisonous to people, but uh, out in space, uh, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is the second most abundant molecule after molecular hydrogen. And astronomers have uh, studied this in, in great detail. So it's from studies of the seal molecules that we have the most information about the large scale structure of molecular clouds. Yeah. I want to touch on one other phenomenon, Your another paper, radiative feedback processes and implications for the initial mass function. So this is again uh, a phenomenon during the formation of the star. Mm -hmm. So what is the radiative feedback process? Okay, so when uh, a star forms, it uh, emits uh, radiation and that heats up the surrounding gas. So as we were discussing earlier, the, when you're forming a star, the, uh, you have this competition between gravity trying to pull the gas in and make the star and the pressure which is pushing out and trying to prevent that from uh, happening. So yeah. the pressure uh, increases with the temperature. It's, it's just linearly proportional to temperature. So as I make the gas hotter, then uh, that increases the pressure and helps it resist gravity. So when I go ahead and I form, start forming stars in a molecular cloud, they then start emitting radiation and they heat up the gas uh, in its surroundings and that then means that the gas and its surroundings can no longer uh, uh, undergo gravitational collapse. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, characteristic features of uh, this initial mass function, which is sort of what is <coughs> the initial distribution 
the masses of stars uh, that form is uh, strongly determined uh, by that. As soon as you start forming these stars, it prevents uh, uh, larger stars uh, from, uh, from forming. Yeah, so, so sort of like uh, once the star is fired up, so to speak, then it's going to push away what is uh, what is remaining in the in the neighborhood. Exactly, it can use it anymore. Right now, this radiative feedback gets far more dramatic when you get to more massive stars. So, in the uh, for low mass stars, actually, it doesn't really push the gas away; it just kind of heats it up and prevents uh, it from uh, undergoing gravitational collapse. When you get to massive stars, then uh, the massive stars produce so much radiation that the uh, the pressure of that radiation can actually can push the gas away. And uh, these massive stars also have very powerful uh, stellar winds, and that is they blow gas away from uh, the, the star itself, and that can uh, push gas away as well. Right. So, so in conclusion, Chris, um, you have done a lot of work in this area. So uh, as you as you look forward, uh, you continue to do research in this area. So what is the area that that is, that's most exciting for you? Uh, and, you know, where do you think we will find interesting things in the next five years? Now, I think that uh, in the next five years, at least on the theoretical side, uh, we will, one of the most interesting things, we'll be trying to get more insight on the formation of the very first stars. Mm. And uh, so these are stars that formed, uh, you know, maybe only uh, 100, 100 millions or hundreds of millions of years after the Big Bang. Yeah. And all those stars that were, uh, had a mass more than about 80% uh, of the mass of the sun would have already uh, essentially burned out all their nuclear fuel and they would be uh, dark. So they will not be, you cannot, will not be able to see them from their light. Um, and we will learn more about them though, because uh, through uh, gravitational lensing, as one of these stars passes in front of a luminous star, then it bends the light and uh, these uh, the new telescopes, uh, such as the uh, uh, Rubin Observatory uh, Telescope, are going to uh, be able to uh, see that. And uh, there's also a, a mission that we launched in space, the Roman Space Telescope, uh, which is, uh, will carry out large surveys and that will help in this regard as well. So uh, if I wanted to, let me just make one other uh, comment. Yeah. That's one way you can try to see these very old stars. The other way is uh, what's called uh, galactic archeology span and uh, that is to look at uh, stars which are more massive than that, so they actually have still uh, 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 emitting light, and look at their composition. <clears throat> the very first stars would have had no um, heavy elements in them, so they would just be hydrogen and helium, um, and with a very tiny amount of uh, lithium, perhaps. But uh, that's all, and you can now look at the spectrum of the stars and see whether there are any heavy elements. So far, we haven't seen any of those. We've seen some that have much less heavy elements than the sun. And those studies are going to be uh, really amplified uh, in the next five years. And finally, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able to see uh, very distant, won't be able to see individual stars, but we'll be able to see clusters of these stars when uh, they first formed. And that will also provide very valuable information. On the theoretical side, the computational uh, capabilities are really just amplifying very rapidly. And I think uh, within the next five years, we'll be able to carry out far more accurate simulations of the, the formation of those stars. Yeah, yeah. In, in exciting times, um, there, there's still a lot to be found, a uh, lot to be uh, done on the theoretical side, a lot of telescopes going out both in space and moon uh, and, and on Earth as well. So a lot of, lot of data is going to come in. And as you say, the computational capabilities are increasing. So it's exciting time for astrophysics. You're exactly right. It's going to be very exciting. And I think that particularly some of the planned uh, uh, telescopes will provide uh, dramatic images uh, also that I think, uh, you know, everybody will be able to appreciate. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for spending time with me. Sure. Well, thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Good luck with the research. Okay.
This is a scientific sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.